Um, I'm Gina Black, and it's my pleasure to host this exciting webinar in conversation with Tommy Harper on behalf of Screen Queensland. Uh, before commencing, we respectfully acknowledge the custodians of the land where this event is taking place today, and we recognise the connection to land, waters, culture and kin that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uphold and pay respects to their elders, both past, present and emerging. And I would especially like to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. So welcome everyone. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce you to our very special guest, Tommy Harper, producer extraordinaire. Now, can I recognize you, Tommy? Hold on, hold on. I'll, let's let's just see. do this. Let's How's do this. this. How do you? <laughs> Hey, now I know who I'm talking to. Yeah. <laughs> Good That's how morning. we met. We yes. certainly did. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I know you've been incredibly busy. Um, so I just want to tell everyone a little bit about you, Tommy. I mean, most people know who you are, but just for the, you know, for the guests that are joining us today. Um, Tommy, you're a veteran of the motion picture business and one of the most sought after producers in the industry. And you've worked on numerous blockbuster films, such wars as Star Wars, Episode 7, The Force Awakens, Mission Impossible 3, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond for J.J. Abrams. Alice in Wonderland, Battle Los Angeles, Jack Ryan, Big Eyes, Top Gun Maverick, wow. And most recently, the upcoming Netflix feature film, Escape from Spiderhead, filmed right here in Queensland on the Gold Coast. That's an amazing, amazing number, volume of films. And that, that, that's not all of them, Tommy. Um, I think just to start things off, this, this, this is a great you know, informal conversation. Um, I'd like to start with a question I know that we would all love to hear the answer to. How did you start out in the industry? Oh, um, I started out in the industry coaching a basketball team. I, uh, oh. Yes, I graduated high school and the school that I graduated from approached me to coach the varsity summer league um, boys basketball traveling team uh, because I was a basketball player and uh, I agreed to it. And I coached the kids all summer long for free because I loved the loved the game and liked to like to teach. And and um, even though they're a year younger than me, and at the end of the season, um, I talked about wanting to get into advertising. And I lived about three hours north of Los Angeles in a in a small community town. And one of the kids on the team approached me and said, "You know, if you ever move to Los Angeles, let me know because my father is a producer there." I had no zero clue what that meant. Uh, I just knew that was something in the entertainment industry. And he said, if you want, I will give you my father's um, phone number. And I've already talked to him about you. And he's more than happy to, to try to introduce you to people or help you out. So I took the number, it put it in my pocket, kept it on my bed, you know, like night table. Moved to, when I moved to LA, I was in school. I called him, his name's Steve Nicolaitis. He had he'd done a lot of Rob Reiner movies at the time. And, um, and he, he said, when you are on summer break, why don't you call me a few months ahead and you can, I have a movie that we're doing over the summer. You can come work for, for me. And I said, great, I'll do whatever's needed. And he, and he kind of laughed and said, do you, do you even know what you're asking? I said, I have no clue. I just tell me when to show up and I'll be there. And so that was my first kind of job. And I showed up at a place called MacArthur Park at 4 a.m. in the morning and I was a production assistant and I was told to lock up traffic and pedestrians and I did that for my first movie and I was in charge of radio so wow yeah so and that's how I started yeah. so I looked at some of the films obviously I've looked at all the films um, that you've worked on so it seems that you've you've come up through the ranks of obviously doing traffic control and then into the world of AD is 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 that the traje trajectory that you took to get to where you are now is that the best path for you yeah, I took this, it's the path that I knew. I took the assistant director path. I, 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 my first job, I quickly identified what I wanted to do. I, I, I liked the assistant director department because 
of the logistics planning and you kind of touched all where you talked in and communicated with all, all the departments. Um, I started acquiring my days to get to join the Directors Guild of America and some way along my first couple of years, I had to, uh, once I joined the DJ, you have to work so many uh, days out of, out of town to, to, to get full membership. And in between trying to get my assistant director jobs, I ended up touching all the departments and, and called friends because I was trying to get an assistant director job out of town and I was off for a month. I'd call the location manager, I'd go work on a movie as a location PA and I'd go work in transportation, work in post-production, uh, read scripts for people. I do anything to try to touch every department to understand what people did. And so um, not saying that I know how to do every job, but I do know what it takes in every department to, to make a movie. And it was truly, it was a lot of help when I made the jump from assistant director to um, become a production manager and then producer. Um, and for the benefit of um, the people that have joined us today, um, DGA is the Directors Guild of America. Um, how hard is it to get into, to become a DGA AD? How, is it like an apprenticeship or how hard is it to do that? It depends on where you're, you're, you're working. I mean, in, in California here, you have, you have to work so many days as a production assistant. You have to submit your application. You have to write letters of recommendations or have them written for you. Um, and then you go through a vetting process and if they accept you, you have to work 150 days out of, out of town to be a full member. You can also join the trainee program and do, I think it's 300 days, and, but the trainee program only takes a certain amount. So if 50 people apply, I think they take you know, six or seven for that year. So it's a very, it's a very uh, difficult program to get accepted to. Um, so I went the production assistant route and did my days and worked my way up that way. So, um, you know, it was a lot of hard work. I, I just worked nonstop for two to three years and got in. I forgo college. I went right to, to, I just kept working, 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 and then joined the DJ, I think, you know, um, around 23 or so. So that's interesting you should say that. So instead of like a, a degree or a college degree, then that the, um, the process of going through um, what I would, we would probably call here an apprenticeship in a strange way, going from job to job really became your degree to get into to where you are yeah. now. So it's just, just a different way of doing it. It's just a different path. And I'm not saying it's one's better than the other. It's just a, yeah. And, and so to do that, that's also relying on, on heads of department that are willing to work with you and train you during that time. Yeah, I mean, I I was very, um, you know, I asked a lot of questions. If I didn't know the answer, I would ask people and I would try to learn and I would try try to engage and, and um, know what, what departments were doing. I think I had, when I was coming up, I, I met a, a producer, another producer that um, liked my my working style and, and let me go into post-production, let me start in early pre-production um, so I, I, I got to learn that at an early point in my career. And, you know, I still say today, I think if you're coming up in, in, to, in the industry, you have to be vocal and you have to ask the question um, if you are interested in something. And, and, and if you get an, I've gotten many no's in my life. I mean, I, I make it sound like I did this to that. And it, it, I had many, many people turn me down. When I was starting to try to make the transition, from assistant director to producer, uh, you know, it was very difficult to have people give me that opportunity because people knew me as one part of my job, didn't want to really give me the chance to do the, the thing I wanted to, to do. And that was, I had, you know, more no's than I ever thought I would. I thought people would actually give me more of a chance, but it was a great learning experience for me and, and toughened me up a little bit. And, uh, so I think you just got to keep pushing through it. And if it's something you really want to do and, and you believe in it, um, nobody should tell you. If they tell you no, just go go to the next person. Mm. And that's another interesting point that you've put up because when you move from one side of the business to another, uh, the transferring of those skills and the ability to somebody to actually put their trust in you and, and take that leap to the next point you know, we do that here as well. And often there's a gap where you might find yourself unemployed for a while because 
and, and tell me if this is right with you, Tommy, you have to start refusing jobs where you get an income while you're trying to keep yourself available for people to see that you're quite serious about taking that job, you know, to yeah. take that leap into the next point. You have to make the decision in your life what you want to do and what's important for you um, yeah. and, and stick to it. And if you can do that, I mean, listen, I, when I was coming up, I, I also had a side business doing a, a car auto detailing that I was detailing all the trailers on the set to make more money, um, to try to try to pay one, pay my rent, but two, stockpile money. Cause I knew once I joined, was trying to transition to be an assistant director, I was going to be out of work. I just knew it. And so um, you, you, you know, you just have to be hungry and you have to, to, if this is what you want to do, you, you, mm. you just got to push for it. And I think, listen, on Spiderhead, we, we came in to Queensland in a very busy time and we met, um, some people that, that it was their first time doing a main unit job or at a movie at this level. And we found some really great talent and we took it. We, I don't want to say we took a chance. We, we met them. We, we talked to people about them and we had a, an uh, inherent personal kind of connection to them on a, as much as you can on a Zoom, but we felt, you know what, they're a good person. We like their, their kind of style. We're gonna give them a chance. And there's, there's a handful or more of people that we, we really, really like and would love to work with again. Um, so I think it's just about working hard and, and and paying your dues and sticking to what you want. Tommy, it's such a pleasure to hear you say that. And, and I do know that's what you were doing and, and, and working with some of your production team. It was, very, it was very enlightening to hear you say that because uh, the Queensland industry, you know, traditionally in international um, connections was actually built on US television series back in the 90s, you know, and, and through to the 2000s. And, and often we have some amazing, um, you know, crew here that have got great TV experience, but often will be overlooked for feature films because it will be deemed that they didn't have the experience for feature films. And yet series television can actually be harder than feature films sometimes, depending what it is. And with streaming coming in at the moment, um, and, the, and you're right, the sheer volume of productions coming in. And, and it's great to talk about Escape from Spiderhead in particular, because you're absolutely right. It came in like a juggernaut. Um, and I and we saw that you were taking these chances and you were giving amazing opportunities to crew that ordinarily would be what we say waiting in the wings for those opportunities and and we all talk about attachments and upskilling but we also talk about the people that already do have experience but maybe not as many feature credits but but they can only gain that experience with with producers like you taking that risk um, and heads of department obviously the heads of department that you bring with you you know, it's a big thing for them not to be able to come with everyone that they usually normally work with. And, and I just want to touch on this because you've worked in some amazing countries around the world on some of these blockbuster films that you've worked on and you, you may have already encountered the same situation with crew there. But, you know, how would you describe, you know, I mean, you hadn't worked in Australia before and certainly not in Queensland. So how, how can you do, do, do describe your experience working here in Queensland? Once you landed I mean, as quickly as you did. <laughs> I'm in Santa Monica. It's like working here. I, I mean, honestly, it, it's, there's no difference whatsoever. I, uh, I would come back tomorrow. I, um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I landed in Queensland and went to quarantine and uh, had a great, actually great time in quarantine for 14 days with my family. Um, and uh, we, 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 Joe Kaczynski, who directed the movie, we had a great time. This was a slingshot production. It really was. We were, our heads were somewhere else. We talked to Chris. We were like, Hemsworth, we were like, we have to make the movie during this time period. Let's go. And we went fast. And um, it, it's, you shoot all over the world and uh, filmmaking is global now. And you, you, you just have to, you know, you just have to have an open mind. And I, I get several calls a week about uh, now that people know I've shot in Australia about tell me about Australia and how is it and like just drive down Santa Monica the same thing it's like <laughs> it's mm -hmm. it's it's the talent is the 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 crew is great the talent is there cast is amazing uh and we had a we had a fabulous time and we really really did and um we did not bring a lot of people over and partly 
because uh, the timing, we wanted to just go in country with a lot of the people. There was quarantine, um, but we really chose to go, uh, you know, sh- as many people hires that we could do in the country. I think back to what you're talking about. We, people that are, are scared me when you said veteran, vet, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've been in the business for a while, you know, but it's like, we have, it's our obligation to train people to come up. And I've done it in my career. I hope I've done it well. We need to continue doing it. Um, And I think, listen, there are assistant directors that I've worked with and very recently even on on Spiderhead that I would tomorrow hire as a supervisor on a movie. There are people that are, you just know that they're talented and they want to learn and you just, you need to give them You need to give them the time and, and to, to, to move up in the world, because if you don't do that, then uh, our industry is not going to grow. So I think every everybody has to do that. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Now, I, I wanted to touch on something. So um, we all talk about the global pandemic. You've already brought up the fact that you had to go into quarantine. So. Can I ask, is, is this the first film that you've produced um, since we've all had to deal with this global pandemic while we've all had to rearrange the ways that they, we do things and, and obviously with COVID safe work plans, risk mitigation plans, the amazing way that you guys dealt with it at the Gold Coast Convention Centre. What challenges for you as, as a super experienced producer, what were the challenges for you? And, and is this the first one that you have done since COVID-19? It's the first movie that I've shot. We've completed one. Um, we were we were in the middle of finishing Top Gun Maverick when when the lockdown in Los Angeles happened, and we were a week before a week I guess a week before lockdown. We um, we ended up coming up with a remote system for our whole team and put it in place and start testing it. And then when when we got locked down in, in LA, we were up and running remotely. So luckily we had we thought of it ahead and got it working. So. We finished a movie, scored a movie, mixed a movie, did all that stuff in, po- in, in quarantine, which was interesting. This is the first movie I've shot in, in, uh, in the pandemic. And, um, and it's uh, <laughs> very thankful that we were in Queensland and very thankful for the government of Queensland and Australia to take the measures that they did to, um, to mitigate the risk of the spread of COVID-19 because you come in, you do your part, you quarantine, and uh, you come out, and you're like, "What has happened? Nobody's wearing masks." And coming from here, where it's it's a you know it is what it is, but it's a mess, and you're wearing your masks all the time. And we took our 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 uh, COVID nineteen policy was was very strict, and 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 it needed to be because we are spending a lot of money in a short amount of time, and we need to mitigate the risk to for the spread. And even though there's low in country. We took masks. We had masks. We had, you know, goggles. All the stuff spread, you know, distance, um, and it's um, it's a challenge. But it, we have to do it because people need to work. and And I also think that we need to put content out in the world for people to to enjoy, and to to view. And whether it's in movie theater or on Netflix or any streaming platform, I think we owe it to everybody to try to do that. And and for jobs. And I think um, once you under, everybody understands the rules. Uh, everybody does their part to to do what's needed. Yeah, and you're quite right. I mean, people do need to work again, you know, um, with um, you know, the Premier of our state, the Honourable Anastasia Palaszczuk, who's also the Minister for Trade and Investment, and we fall under trade and investment, um, you know, and, and also dealing with Queensland Health. You know, the, the recovery of our state during COVID, is it's about jobs and businesses getting up and running again. And and screen in particular is, is um, a very important part of, of obviously what we do here in Queensland. Um, and I think, um, and, and you're right, the support that, that you have been given and that the COVID marshals have and the screening and the processes that goes on. And I was just astounded when I walked into the Gold Coast Convention Centre and saw the amazing processes that were put in place, but how quickly people seem to adjust. Yeah, um, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, we had a Netflix was very uh, had a great policy in an order and, and had a amazing kind of deck that everybody listened to and went through and understood their their part. Um, we were very fortunate on, on Escape from Spiderhead, where 
when we came in, as you know, we were on the phone um, with Netflix trying to find a space and we, we had no clue where we were, where we were going to go. We we're looking for warehouses. By luck, we found the Gold Coast Convention Center, which I tell people all the time was kind of the, the it was a dream because it was, we had, it was our own little bubble in a way. And we had our own kind of entrance. We didn't have to share with people. We, it was fantastic. And plus just a great place to build a soundstage that wasn't really soundstage, but had air conditioning, was quiet, had halls that we could build in all departments there. We, it just all fell into place. And so it did happen quick. And, um, but also thank you and to your team for helping us get in there and for all the initial scouting at the beginning. Yeah, and I do remember that first phone call, Tommy. It was on uh, Google Hangout and it was on my iPhone and it was everyone's using these new systems. And, and I had and, no clue where anything was, remember? I was like, well, what about this place? You're like, no. Nah. <laughs> I know. And it's like, and, and so often, Tommy, you know, we've got amazing studios here. We've got, we've got Spring Queensland Studios, which is based up here in Brisbane. And we've got Village Roadshow Studios that are based down the Gold Coast. And and for years, we've always said to people, but, you know, if they're busy and, and fortuitously, they are busy at the moment, which is wonderful, but there are always options of warehouses and other places. And, and you know, in normal times, people are only interested in the studio component. And that very first phone call we had was so refreshing that you didn't mind. It was like, is there a warehouse? Is there a convention center? And so for the first time in a long time, people are thinking, like you are and you do this in other territories around the world and it's refreshing to hear that these options can come up and and you're absolutely right about the Gold Coast Convention Centre but you know probably a year ago somebody would said I'd never go there there's a sand problem there's a light problem there's it's too close to to air you know aircraft going over the top but so so when you first went in there what were your initial thoughts when you saw the space before you actually created the environment that became a working stage for you? Well, um, I I saw the space on um, on uh, FaceTime, and um, I will not take credit. Georgie, my production manager, got us all set up. I Joe and myself came out two weeks out from quarantine and jumped in and and. We could not have done it without her and and the team. And because we saw the space on FaceTime, we went on the website, looked at it. Duncan, you know, Jones, our our, our uh, location manager, gave us all the specs, pictures. We looked at it, and we were like, "Great! It's super high. It's soundproof. It's they're they want us. They're accommodating." We were like, you know, all speed, just light speed ahead, go. And um, and so it was fantastic. And then when I first drove in the first day coming coming to to the office I was even though I'd seen it like kind of we've done walkthroughs on zoom and Duncan walked us through everything where the checkpoints and this and that and Georgie and I were always talking about like where people would go and how the setup and what she was doing and all that stuff but I was pretty blown away about how just I, I, I just can't explain it unless you were there it's like going to a sporting event and pulling your car up to 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 park and but it's all your world and very organized and in, I mean, it was air conditioned, soundproof. We fed everybody there. The, the convention mm. center did, did the food. We had, we had green areas where people could go eat and take their masks off in a beautiful little courtyard outside. I mean, it re- truly was the best space to for this movie because we were we were only ten days on location and the rest on a soundstage. Yeah, it's. It, I just want to touch for a moment on on virtual scouting. So obviously when people can't come out and scout like they would normally do, and, and we work with Ozfilm and everyone knows, you know, that, that, that Deb who, who worked with you, who's now working for Netflix, used to be the CEO of Ozfilm. You know, we don't do those scouts anymore because it's really hard for people to come in. So, you know, LiDAR scanning of areas and virtual tours and even FaceTime like you did. Um, yeah. You know, once upon a time, it will be considered, oh, we can't do it that way. But but it's encouraging to hear that you say, well, if that is the only way, then at least, you you know, you can actually see it. And, and you know how to visualize it because you're an experienced producer. And obviously, you know, it's easy for you to see it. But having people that are on the ground doing that for you, which is what we're, we're trying to do, you know, with other productions at the moment, if you can't come in, we'll take you on a virtual tour you know, we can, we can employ someone to do some LIDAR scanning for you so that you can actually see that 
area and you can fit your set in there. And we did that with Screen Queensland Studios you know, on the first production that went in there as well. So, I mean, can you just explain how, how well that can work now as opposed to maybe a year ago when that might have been something that nobody would consider? I think it has to work now because you can't, I can't get on a plane. There's a, there's a television series I'm, I'm producing right now and we can't get on a plane to go somewhere yeah. and scout. You know, I've got people all spread out all over the world trying, trying to, to, to make the show and where, you know, where you, you kind of have to do it. It's not that I, I will, I, I won't lie to you. It's not the best way to go about it, but it is the way to, if you want to make a, a series or, or, or a film, you have to do it. And, and what I do find is you have to, you, you, there are things when we came out of quarantine, when we went and, and put our toes on the ground, we, we really were like, huh, okay, well, do we have to be out here for this? Or can we go to this place for that? There's things that inherently will come up, but I think you do as much as you can virtually and try to do it FaceTime because the FaceTime is good because the director can go, what's to the right or what's to the left? And he or she can, you know, pan around and you can kind of check it out. I think also just we had a uh, location uh, uh, group had drones and we would do some aerial stuff and as much visual aid you can you can give. Um, if you're doing a really, really intense location show, you just got to come out earlier and be on the ground. You can do an initial, you know, kind of thing to kind of drill in everybody's head and figure out where you're going and uh, get your list in order. So you're not seeing 30 places, you're seeing five when you land that I think you can do. But um, so there, there's a fair amount you, that can be done. Uh, and it's just the world we live in now. So you kind of got to adapt to it. And I think adapting is good. And, and we often talk about the word pivoting. Um, we try not to use cliche words, but we do know that some people like Duncan Jones and, and you mentioned Georgie, there's, there's lots of other vendors that normally do things in different ways that are, are actually reaching out to do different things to, to support the industry for people like you that can't come out and see things. And, and it's made a big difference. So it's actually brought a different model for some people's businesses and it's increased their ability to, to work on international productions more, whereas maybe a year ago that wouldn't have been the case. So it's again, like most things, you know, COVID has got some incredibly negative things, but, but out of it has come some great positive outcomes for people. Um, and obviously you're experiencing that and, and that's, really, that's really good to hear. But I just wanna to touch on your experience of being in Queensland. So obviously we've talked about the film, the convention center, the crew, what was your experience like? And I know that you film around the world and you mentioned to me when I met with you that where you can, you try and take your family with you because you're away for long periods of time. So while you were here in Queensland, were you able to do that? And if so, were you were able to take any time out to go anywhere else while you were in Queensland? Yeah, I mean, yes, they traveled with me to Queensland and I, I do that. I mean, most projects, I'm, I'm in a place for a year or longer. This was just happened to be a really quick uh uh, film. I mean, on Maverick, it's been three plus years. We're still we're still going, but because it's not out yet. But uh, so usually it's a very long duration. Um, I was, you know, like everybody within. I had to stay within Queensland, except for when I traveled home and I went through Sydney and spent a few days there. But I we went out to with Sundays and went out to Hayman Island and uh, mm -hmm. we popped over when we could, could and saw parts of you know Byron Bay, New South Wales, right across the border. And then we, you know, we did some uh, Noosa and uh, did some hiking locally. And so we, we tried to do something every weekend, um, even if it was a local drive, we went to Brisbane, um, even though we quarantined there, we're like, okay, let's go check it out. Um, so yeah, we, we tried to, to, to go around and see everything. I mean, my son was playing basketball on the weekends and, and we were trying to live a life that we couldn't have him lived here a while. So we, um, yeah, we got, we got out, out and about. That's brilliant to hear. And I didn't realize you'd gone to so many places. Um, you certainly yeah. took advantage of the time when you could get out and you've gone to some really great spots. I mean, the Whit Sundays, Noosa, and we don't mind you talking about Byron Bay. We, we've been trying to get a Queensland postcode for Byron for an awfully long time, but <laughs> I don't think we'll it's quite crazy. do that. It's crazy. It's all so close. Yeah. It's, it's I know amazing, it's, yeah. it's literally over, over the border and fortuitously when the border has closed, unfortunately, you know, that, that area is like a residential zone and it's a zone where you can still travel freely. So it does help, but but you've also been to some wonderful places up there and Brisbane's a great city as well. And I'm sure when you were in quarantine and you wouldn't have seen too much of it anyway, but it, 
it is glorious with the river and Goma and there's some amazing places there. It's, it's, it's great. And so did your family had a good time while you were working all those long hours? They had lots to do during yeah. the day? Yeah, no, they, they, it was great. You know, listen, as you know, everybody knows you're, you're up at 4.30 in the morning. So, you, you know, there's a fair amount you could do before you go to work. And, and we, were, we shot 10 hour days, so you could have be home for dinner most mm -hmm. nights. And we, we had a, we really had a great time. It's, you know, we, we joked every day. We kept saying, thank you, Chris Hemsworth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it just, it was all, it just all came together. We were trying to get this movie made for years. Uh, and we were trying to do it for Top Gun. And then we, then, then we decided, oh, we can't do that. We got to do Top Gun. And we were talking about going somewhere else. And then it all just started falling into place. And, um, uh, it's one of those movies that just, it's a great experience all around, top to bottom. And with those challenges, um, we know that obviously Chris Hemsworth, we'd, we'd love to call him a Queenslander. Um, you know, he spends a lot of time up here working on films, but just in terms of the restrictions that you had with him and dealing with COVID safe work plans and a, and a new model of a schedule, which obviously takes a bit more time to kind of get through, were there any particular challenges on top of all the ones that you did of, of also having to have your lead at by a certain time did, did that did that create a lot more challenges for you and your team no we um it didn't we we really uh came up with a plan we did a lot of work we did a two week um as soon as we came out of quarantine and got into the office we did a rehearsal period with our cast um and i mean chris was doing six seven pages a day some days so it was a lot of work and um but i think it set the tone for the movie and we had to move quick regardless because of the schedule we were trying to hit for the movie and and for the budget and for the to get it into post so it set the tone of the movie which was fantastic um it was great having him at the beginning of the movie because it, it just we just everybody got into the rhythm it got a you know the tone of the movie just not so much as far as what's gonna you're gonna see uh on the screen but just the morale of the film and how everybody's working together. Um, the, the COVID protocols, I don't think slowed us down. Um, it, I think at the beginning, everybody's just kind of trying to learn and, and understand, oh, I, right, I can't, we can't all gather around here or, or you know, for the director, it's a, it's a bit tough because they're, they're communicating with the actor with a mask on a lot, but you get through it. And the cast was great. They, they put the masks on when they had to, they had uh, covers up covers, you know, when they had makeup and they couldn't wear the, 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 the masks. Um, so I, you know, I don't know, you know, I think in the States it might, it, it, you know, it just, depending on where you're working, it might slow you down a little bit more. I just don't, um, for us, it didn't, it didn't really have a massive impact. I mean, our testing was fantastic. We had quick turnarounds. Um, we, we had a, a lot of people doing, uh, doing our testing, a lot of people on set making sure that our uh, surface areas were clean, that everybody was adhering to masks. I mean, we really had a, a great um, system in place, you know, through, through the film. It, it's great because, it, again, the day I came in, you were doing, there was a COVID testing day and Katrina Elders and Ed, who's the local guy that's the COVID supervisor, was super busy, but it was so efficient. It was so yeah. efficient and so fast. It was like a process. And because I'd walked in there, I could see that everyone was so used to it. It was, it's like everyone's just like, like we all got used to it. You know, it was just like, yep, that's what I do. I go in there. That's a door I go into. The, the signage everywhere was phenomenal. You, you could not have made a mistake about where you needed to be or what zone you were in. And that takes an awful lot of planning. Um, are you doing something? So you mentioned that you're on a show now um, in LA. Uh, are the, are the protocols the same there? Are, are there any learnings that you've taken from your experience in Queensland, working with our COVID marshals in Queensland Health? Are there any learnings from here that you can that can help the production that you're currently in pre-production on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's listen. I I because I've talked to a lot of producers that that are doing projects everywhere, and I think I think for for me, I think it's it's adhering to I, the if I, if I'm doing it or not with Netflix or another studio it's it, I feel like you know Netflix did a great thing I think because we we knew our rules and I think you got to take it and you got to you can't you really just got to stay within your rules and as soon as you start to go outside those it just it just starts breaking 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I learned on, 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 on Spiderhead was in, in Queensland was you, even outside before you came into our world, life is normal, no masks. Everybody's like, I mean, especially in Queensland where you, there's no, you could just, life's normal in a way, You're like whatever normal is right now. But as soon as you came in, because everybody knew and understood what the rules were, they, they totally adhered to it. And, and mm -hmm. they got out of the car, put the masks on and boom. It's like you're in work and you, you know what you're supposed to do. And I feel like that wherever you're shooting around the world, you've got to adapt that same method. Even It doesn't you know, matter if, 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 you, uh, if you don't like to wear a mask. Um, if, you, if you're up high and you're working and you, you, something's wrong and you have your visor on and your mask, and you, then let's talk about it. And that's what Katrina and Ed did, where let's talk about it and let's have a conversation and let's make you safe first and we will get through it. And that's what was great about this group was they – just wasn't like wearing a mask to walk away. It was like, no, no, we, mm. first of all, we don't want you to fall. I want to have a conversation. We want to make sure everybody's safe. Let's do that. Netflix was totally on board with that. And then we came up with a solution and fixed the problem. And I think that's what, you know, I learned on this movie. You got to take, take to every film. Yeah. And I think that's a great thing that you were just saying then. It's almost like we've all been, at, our positions have all been outranked by COVID. But once you have a COVID plan, plan put in place and everyone knows what that is, then you get straight back into production. And I think the more streamlined that becomes and as people are becoming more skilled at doing that and, and having Katrina Elders, you know, head that team from Netflix, who obviously is looking after all the COVID, um, so, you know, safe work plans and risk mitigation plans on behalf of Netflix. You know, I spent some time with her as well and, and she introduced the team and, you know, she had some learnings as well. But obviously we all know that all studios, you know, have their own rules and regulations, but they adapt them to what we call local custom in the area that we are. And as you said, you know, you, you go outside of that environment and then you go into, you know, an area where nobody's wearing masks. And, 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 and it, it is a fantastic environment in Queensland because, you know, we've been so lucky to have been on it so fast. Um, and it is like a normal life outside, you know, it, it does make it much easier. Yeah, and it, it, listen, I've worked with Katrina before and I was very thankful to have her in the movie. And I think, you know, one of the other big finds where, where I was having Ed with us at Sweetly and, and Ed, who, who lives in Queensland and did a fantastic job uh, uh, bridging with uh, Katrina. And Ed mm -hmm. also, you know, would explain to us what's, what's and Netflix, what's happening in country. Here's what we're doing. Uh, yes, we're locked down here or, but we can still work. And we're, you know, it was great to have the, both of them on the, on the film uh, with us. And they were, were very much knowing we have to make a movie, knowing we have to keep everybody safe and, and coming up with a good plan to, to move forward. Well, we're going to go to a few more questions uh, from, sure. from some of the um, audience that have joined us today. And we had some that came in earlier, but just one thing I wanted to ask you, um, what is the most, what is your favorite film to date that you've worked on? What has been the most exciting experience that you've had? What, what is the I've one that in, you say, wow? I've gotten in trouble by this before. <laughs> I like getting people in trouble. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, um, it's hard to say. I, I really, I, I will say, but I've had a great experience on each one. I mean, they're, they're, everybody, everyone has their, advantages and, and sometimes disadvantages. I mean, I, I'm really excited for the world to see, you know, Maverick when it comes out, Top Gun. Uh, we we shot um, so much in camera and in, in real jets and we shot a lot of practical uh, on location throughout California, Nevada, Washington. And um, and we had a really, really great time and, and I'm really excited. That was a great experience, really fun. Um, Star Wars Force Awakens was just, it's one of, it's a, it's, listen, if you get offered that job and especially number seven coming back from, from the gap of, of the films, it was, it was really a lot of pressure to, to deliver it. And uh, it was, it was, you know, a dream to work on it. And I would say that's pretty, pretty high. Um, I've done several with Tom Cruise, all the, a few of the missions and, and, uh, and those are spectacular in themselves because they're, tra you travel around the world, they're extremely demanding um you you they're logistically it's moving hundreds and hundreds of people while you're having you know could be a thousand people in another uh country prepping it's it's a lot to 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 handle um but so those are fun 
And I, you know, listen, I've done a lot of Trek, Star Trek movies and, and like, mm. like Star Wars and you build worlds. Those are equally as fun and, and figuring out how to, how to everything that you, you know, you can't just show up to a location and point your camera and shoot at it. They all have to be created. So those are, those are a, um, a blast as well. So, you know, each has their, their, their loves. And um, I've been mm. fortunate to, to work on a lot of great projects. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. It's like, telling us who your favorite child is really, but. <laughs> the political answer, yeah. No, no, no that's true. Thank you for sharing that. Now we've got a question. So uh, Taryn Smith has um, sent a question and says, how does a Queensland screenwriter without representation go about pitching and having their project produced? Well, I think it goes, it's, listen, even if you are, you have, a, have an agent, it's hard to get your project produced. And I think, um, I think it's it's all about trying to write good material, uh, submit things to the blacklist, which is a web you know you can submit your scripts to or that are un, you know scripts that aren't haven't got bought or made or they've been bought or haven't been made. I think you just got to write, 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 and the more you write, the the better you get, and keep knocking on people's doors. And and if like I said at the beginning, if people they don't answer your email, you know I don't take offense to it sometimes people just don't do that. They don't answer emails. It's just their working style. They just don't want to do it. They want it to go through a different route. Sometimes people do answer your email. So mm. don't be shy, don't quit and, and keep writing. It's great to hear you keep saying that. You've talked about perseverance from the very beginning and it's a really important, it's, it's a really important tip to give someone. Um, I'm still trying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, I've got a great question here from Harry Sabulis. Um, what was personally your biggest incentive for filming in Queensland? And would you have made the same decision if COVID-19 hadn't affected the industry and the world the way that it did? So we, yeah, I mean, we, uh, Chris, Chris, you know, wanted to do the movie and we, we had to come to him to shoot the film because of schedule and everything. And so that was a big draw. Um, yes, if COVID-19 wasn't here and we weren't in a pandemic, worldwide pandemic, yes, we would still go there. Um, I Several projects that, that, you know, even if um, the actor is not there, uh, I would look to coming to Queensland um, to shoot, regardless if, if somebody's there that we have to go to or not, because I think it's, it's a great place to shoot. I think the rebate's fantastic. I think the cast is great. I think the crew's great. I think... Screen Queensland, I think everybody I dealt with when I was there it was fantastic. The government is wants to make it work as well. So for me, it's it's you know one of the top couple places that you look at when you are figuring out how to how to, where to set up a movie, mm -hmm. and that's what happens is you you talk to somebody on the phone, you have a conversation about the, the material, you talk about where you're going to go, you talk about incentives, you talk about crew, you talk about space availability, and so you know it's it's right up with London and all the other places that where people are shooting now. Thank you. And we've got a question here from Kim Meltzer. Um, what tips would you have liked someone to have told you about producing that you've had to find out for yourself? Oh, um, uh, I probably work more now than I did when I was in AD <laughs> hours. Um, I think there's a false sense of people going, oh, you're a producer, it must be nice. You know, you wake up late and you do. I, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm working more now than, than, than ever the hour, which is fine. I love it. The hours are very long. You're, you're, uh, you are always on the phone. You're always communicating. You need to make sure you communicate uh, with everybody, everybody to know what's going on. Nobody really sat me down and told me what a producer does. I just figured it out. I mean, obviously I worked and saw what people, what people um, do. Uh, but I think the hours, um, you think they go down, but they don't, they just get more. That's interesting. So how do you keep up your energy levels like that? Cause that you're, yeah. you're obviously, um, You've got a great energy behind you, Tommy. You've got this amazing energy. And I noticed when I worked with you, everyone that was coming around and talking, it, it's, um, it's contagious. You, your, your energy is really, really, uh, you can see the effect that it has on the people around you. So how do you maintain that? Well, thank you for that. I, um, I think it's very important to, you know, 
when you're lead, when you are trying to lead people or you're a leader, you you have to people will will follow you and, and work hard if you treat people kindly, you treat them with respect, you take care of them, they know that they're in a safe place. I think that there's it's an understatement and I've learned from uh, some from the best and I've I've observed and watched CEOs, I've watched directors who have companies, I've watched how they work and how they treat people. And um, I think that's very, very important to, to treat people how you want to be treated. Um, also that the PA could be your boss in 10 years, five years. Um, so sure, you're going to have run-ins with people and sure you have to be tough. That doesn't mean you're weak either. Um, mm -hmm. And personally for me, I, you know, it's a, it's a life thing. I try to, you know, I like, I love to work out. I try to do, I do that every day. It makes, sets my mood. It, it helps me deal with everything that I'm dealing with all day long. And you try to balance a lot of different things to make you sure your life is happy. If you're, if you're happy and your family life's happy, then, then I think it says a lot. And, and, uh, you know, it just, it comes out even when you're at work. It's a fabulous philosophy to have on life, Tommy. It, it's, it's, it's beautifully encouraging to hear that. And, and, you know, to, to be able to maintain that and to be able to come in and do those amazing hours and have your family around you, you obviously have a wonderful um, ethic to, to the way you run your life, but also the way that you approach your day and, and also the way you approach the people that you, you work with, which is wonderful. And, I, and obviously having your family around you has got a lot to do with that because you've got them to go home to at night. Um, but but yeah. true leadership is, is such an important thing. You're right, because the film industry is based on military precision in many ways. But, but, but leadership is what you were doing. You don't send people in over the hill. You, you lead them. You lead them. You take them in. So it, it's you lead them refreshing. In, yeah. And, and sometimes you, 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 know, you have to make a decision. You, sometimes the best thing when you're leading is people are waiting for you to figure out what's happening. You have to make a decision and move on. You hope it's always the right decision. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the hardest thing is just to make a decision. And a lot of times you'll see people freeze or you'll see your company freeze or what have you because no decisions are made and people are kind of like walking around like zombies and they don't know what to do. And you know, you just have to make a decision and, uh, and surround yourself with great people. I try to hire people that are better than me. I would love to hire everybody that's makes it that's that I can rely on. And I, if I'm sick or I can't come to work, it continues. I'm, I am, believe me, still going on, even if I don't show up. So you want to make sure you surround yourself with the best as well. Mm. And you clearly did. I mean, obviously you had a team that you, you already had and, and you mentioned Georgie and you mentioned Duncan and I, I obviously you had a lot of amazing Queenslanders and, and for those that don't realize, Georgie Marquis is a Queenslander that worked overseas for a long time and, and herself had to upskill when she came back. And that's part of what our, you know, attachment program, which is for early career, mid career, but also people that are upskilling. And even somebody as experienced as Georgie still had to upskill um, to make sure that she was up to date with local knowledge because she'd been overseas for such a long time. So it's encouraging to hear you say that. And so, you know, people are constantly trying to up their skill, upskill themselves and, and, you know, learn what the new techniques are and learn what the latest equipment is. So, yeah, and you need that experience when you go into somebody else's territory because the equipment isn't always the same. You know, the vendors aren't all the same. The way we do things is often slightly different. What the grips do and the gaffers do, you know, their terminology is different and they work with different things. So it's, it's great and encouraging. It's a very collegiate approach to filmmaking, but with your energy and leadership, that, that certainly makes their job a lot easier too. I do have I'm just happy she answered. I, I'm just happy she answered my phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't I let her say no. She'll tell you the story. She was in quarantine, answered my phone call, introduced myself, said, I have a movie, we're coming here. Oh, okay. I said, you're available. Yes. Okay, great. I'll call you tomorrow. Click. <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah, because she, yeah, you're right. She was in quarantine herself for a while. And then you, you know, then she got out and then you were in quarantine and, yeah. and, and everyone's nervous about the next job. And the, that's why I wanted to ask, is this the first one you've done, you know, since COVID? Because it's daunting for every single professional, no matter how many shows you've got behind you, it's daunting. And now that we're actually, you know, getting into a, a beautiful rhythm and a great rhythm and to see how well your production 
worked um, and, and then they have great confidence going on to the next film and that great confidence attracts more people to come in because they know that if you've got through that one then then you've got through it you know it, it works really yeah. well I, we're almost running out of time now but I've just got another question that's come in and, and it's um and then it's because we've got a mixed audience you know you know having this conversation with us today so what advice would you give to aspiring filmmakers and producers joining us on this webinar today? Is there, is there any advice you can give to aspiring people? Is there, is there anything here in Australia that you've learned about the way we do things in Queensland? You obviously met a lot of people, you've worked with a lot of crew, you can see that our challenges can sometimes be different. Is there anything in particular, any tips you can offer them, you know, to help them to get to the next stage that, that maybe you may have actually noticed on, in your journey during Escape from Spiderhead? Well, I think even if I, this question, you know, has been asked to me before and, uh, in, you know, where, wherever I am. And, and I think, um, you know, we have the benefit of, um, you know, one of our post-production assistants who's downstairs right now, I'm going to meet with him after this and talk about his short film that he directed that's brilliant. And he did it all at his apartment. He was, the, you know, did 90% of it himself. And I think that's what you have to do. And you can do that today because of, you know, you have an iPhone, you can shoot something on here, you can shoot it on your iPad, you can cut it on your computer. I think if you're a director, you're a writer, you just got it do it yourself and don't wait for somebody and try to get your stuff out there and try to get it shown, try to get it shown in festivals and just work, work, work. And that's, that's the best thing you can do now. When I was coming up, you had to shoot, go find, you know, film and shoot, shoot your, your, your short. Now you can just do whatever you want as quickly as possible. And I think that's the thing you got to do is just keep, keep plugging away and try to get your image out there. And, and um, like I said before, just don't be shy and try to try to get your product out there. That's great advice. And I think, you know, we all know the value of iPhones. In fact, even taking photos, you know, for location scouting these days, some of the iPhone images that come out, you know, are often better than some of the best cameras that we have as well. Yeah. And I would also say this, I would also say go to AFI website and look at the movies from the past, you know, X amount of years that have won, you know, Oscars or Academies or AFI uh, awards. And, and don't just watch new stuff and current things. Watch old films, watch silent films, watch, just try to become a, a, a student of uh, cinema history. That's the other thing I would, I would recommend um, because we all do it. Any, anytime we get in a room and we talk about script, people bring up uh, Citizen Kane, they bring up old films, they bring up films that, are, that don't have dialogue, they talk about shot co composition, you talk about lighting, you talk about uh, actors' movements. I think if you're a director, Joe brought Joe brought this up uh, one time. Take an acting class if you're a director. Know what an actor goes through. Uh, know what you're asking somebody to do for you. I think those are important uh, things to do uh, as well. That's great advice, Tommy. You know, watching films from all eras is so important. You know, just because the storytelling. It's the same, it's, it's, but the art of filmmaking, you know, can change in the way you just described it then, especially when there's a lot of extra visual effects that are brought into films. Like, where is the real action? Where's the visual effects? How do you merge those worlds? You know, what, what different platforms that you're working on? And that would be the yeah. difference that people would be looking at. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you want to know what's in the future, what's that expression they use, always look behind you. And, it, and if you look at those wonderful, amazing films, yeah, or talk to a teenager. I mean, I'm, my 13 year old shows me stuff all the time. Dad, look what I found on YouTube. Do you know you can do this? I'm like, wow, that's interesting. I mean, I you just learn from anything and everything. I'm, that's what I'm a believer in is just, I, I mean, listen, I try to talk to and just learn every day. If you're not learning, then something's happening, but just get out there and, and ex try to experience something. And by the way, it's just not film, it's, it's music, it's art, it's, it's, um, it's anything you can, you know, in the arts that you can you can learn from and get a visual style. I think is is very helpful. That's brilliant advice. So we've reached we've reached our time, unfortunately. But uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Tommy Harper, it's been an absolute pleasure being in conversation with you today. You've been incredibly generous um, with giving us your time, but also giving us your amazing insights and. And I wish you great success in, in post-producing Escape from Spiderhead. 
I think we're all going to, we're very excited to eventually see it. And, and we hope that we get more Netflix projects that come in and, and you're obviously doing a brilliant job at being an ambassador for Queensland and, and we'd love you to continue on doing that. And most especially, we'd love to see you back here. So Tommy, thank you so, so much. And we look forward to seeing you when you come back. And thank you, thank you for having us and thank everybody in on Screen Queensland in the government, Gold Coast conventions or everybody, thank you very much for making it happen because we, we wouldn't have been able to do it so fast or at all without your support. So thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, have a great Bye. day. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye bye, bye.